Hello everyone and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today we have, once again, it's Conrad and he's going to talk something about, he's one of the like most recurring guests on my channel now, like four, four or five, five episodes, I, I guess, uh, including yeah, one that's... previously and this one. Yeah, Sounds so it's always... Right. It's always good to see you and uh, uh, thank you thank, thank you likewise and of course i'm very happy that well you know you still want to have me here uh, there is such a concept as overstaying one's welcome but i'm very happy to see that i haven't i don't seem to have reached it yet so that's that's always good news yeah i think so, yeah. i think uh, everyone has been waiting for uh, this episode eagerly, and we had to move from Saturday to Wednesday. So, but we will decide later whether we want to keep it on weekdays or weekends. Mm -hmm. Or you guys can also let us know, like in YouTube chat, like what do what you prefer. So uh, yeah, without without yeah, further ado, yeah. yeah, sure, let's let's go. Okay. Uh, well, welcome everyone very happy that this is the slot you have chosen to go for on a wednesday i hope i can make it worth your while in terms of time uh the general title is the best idea i've come up with for today's episode sorry i'm sure one comment i think for some reason i'm seeing my yes now it's working thank you uh the title for this sales and demand forecasting that's sort of a, maybe not the most elegant title i maybe i should have said demand forecasting because if you have demand but there's no supply then you're gonna have zero sales even if there was demand uh, but that's a sort of a potato potato some discussion sometimes and in terms of the kind of models we use for that uh that's for practical purposes interchangeable uh so well, the usual reminder of the story so far for those of you who feel like refreshing your memories. Uh, we'll talk about two thing, uh, three things uh, in this in this episode. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, they are they don't exactly lead to one another in a nice elegant fashion that the way, for instance, the ones in the linear linear models episode did or the ones in finance, but they all fall, fall under the general umbrella. What can we do in terms of predicting sales, well, sales of stuff? That's That would be the very elegant way to put it. First thing is the Croston model. Uh, the Croston model as an idea is based around our old friend by now, namely exponential smoothing. Much like exponential smoothing, uh, it came around in an era where people, you know, in industrial applications had less computing power at, they, at their disposal than I do in my phone. And that's not exactly the most recent model. Uh, then we'll talk about the, what would you call it, general machine learning approach. Uh, if you recall the comparison I made in the first episode about the piece of wood and two nails. That's more or less what we're going to do here. We're going to look at a new problem of somewhat new pre predicting sales and then reduce it to a, I think, well-known method. And finally, a little bit of a, a fringe slash experimental section, namely what can we do if we have to predict uh, future sales for new products. New product means by definition, they are new, which means they don't have a sales history. So we can't really do an awful lot uh, in terms of, well, exploiting the, the history via, via time series methods. Uh, before we start, uh, I actually had a bit of a dilemma how to, uh, what sort of data set to use. And I decided to go for eventually for the data from the M5 forecasting accuracy competition. Uh, the five is there not just because someone like number five, but it's actually a recurring one, uh, been going on for 10, 15 years. And the fifth edition uh, was hosted on Kaggle. For some reason, the sixth one was not. Uh, it is what it is. Uh, well, as you can see from the description page, that's a bunch of uh, stores in the United States across three states, uh, hierarchical structure of products, level, department, etc and a bunch of explanatory variables. Uh, in the interest of keeping track of time, I will briefly scroll over the preparation bit because the data, while 
having the nice content through respect to what you want, did not exactly have the friendliest of formats. Feel free to, uh, well, review it at your own pace and then ask any questions you might have. Uh, obviously, we need to shrink the data because that thing was big. Uh, melt from white to long, combine with calendar information, drop the things that are not needed. And this is the setup we come up with at the start, at the, as an exit point. So we have our data prepared. Let's move to part one. By the way, the general idea, as usual, feel free to ask questions. And then I defer to Abhishek's judgment at which point is there enough mass of questions that it makes a good idea to pause. Perhaps, I don't know, uh, after each part is finished or something, that would be a sort of natural point. Uh, but you know how to ask by now. So uh, Croston model, as I indicated earlier, Croston model came up uh, as a sort of, well, okay, we have exponential smoothing in all sorts of variants uh, that we can apply to well, any series we can get our hands on. Uh, the question is what happens if we apply it to data that's specifically related to time series, uh, to sales time series, where the, ah, here it is. Uh, what's so special about uh, sales and demand time series? Well, long story short, they're intermittent, which is a fancy way for saying they have long strings of zeros. Uh, this can be for all sorts, for all sorts of reasons. There was, as I mentioned earlier, there was continued demand, but there was no supply. So we can't, well, we can't sell anything. Uh, the store was closed, product was, withdrew, product was withdrawn, all sorts of things. This is a general feature that recurs in any sales data you'll be, you'll be dealing with, prolonged strings of zeros. Uh, the first approach we, took, we take to that is, is the cross the model, like I said, the repurposed uh, exponential smoothing because it's repurposed exponential smoothing uh, that means we are only analyzing one series at a time which means this is univariate uh, basic approach you have summarized here i won't be well because i personally hate when someone presents something and then reads it out loud i won't do it to you the two important bits it focuses on and uh, well the estimate of the level but our, that's our series XD of actual recorded sales for demand. And this is our estimate. So far, nothing special. Basic exponential smoothing, no trend, no seasonality, nothing. The important bit is uh, periodicity. Namely, we want to look at how long it takes between consecutive observations for something new to happen. And we model this by essentially, if you recall exponential smoothing, we had the level, then we wanted to model the trend. How did we model the trend? Pretty much the same philosophy as the level, just add another equation. This is the same idea uh, behind the Croston model. We have the estimate of the level and then an estimate of the time it takes between uh, two occurrences of non-zero non demand. Two occurrences of non-zero demand in this instance will be the time it takes or number of observations between this, which is the last non-zero one before the uh, flatlining, and the first one right after. Uh, and then we combine those two, uh, a ratio to for forming a ratio. So normalize the estimate by the estimated duration. So what does it really look like in practice? As I mentioned earlier, our big data, our entire data set that we'll be using is multivariate. And this one, we, we, we just subset to, well, specific uh, item, and a specific store, we only we only care about the timestamp column and the actual sales value, because uh, if you recall also from exponential smoothing, it does not have any natural mechanism to incorporate uh, uh, additional explanatory covariance. So kind of like with basic profit, sales, uh, sorry, target quantity and timestamp. Uh, this is what our data looks like. Uh, shout out. Well, you have the link in the code uh, for a fantastic implementation written by Mr. Nicolas van der Poot. Have a look, have a, give a clap on Medium or whatever other manner you deem appropriate for showing your appreciation. 
we define the crosstone class. It just takes as input our time series, then step by step, well, pretty much implement the formula uh, you saw above, generate the future forecasts, nothing particularly strange or, or surprising here. Essentially, you look at this code, you read the block on top, then you look at this code again, again and they go like, ah, yeah, I get it. If not, ask in the comments. Uh, and then we generate a, a prediction, the usual way, fit the input data set, specify how long into the future do we want to predict, and this is what we get. Uh, da, 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 da. Calculate mean squared error, again, nothing in particular. Uh, the my RMSE function, it's just my wrapper around calculating mean, mean squared error, then the root mean squared error, and then rounding it to four digits so it's actually readable. Uh, it was just faster than typing the whole shebang every single time. Uh, what, what does our prediction look like in practice? Well, something along those lines. Uh, the good news, well, it kind of seems to follow the dynamics. So that's good. It does flatline where the original series flatlines. So that's the good part. Uh, however, it doesn't flatline at zero. So that's not so good. Uh, so as usual, the question is, can we do something to improve it? And the answer is yes. Yes, we can. Uh, pretty much what we would like to do is to make sure that if there was no demand for a prolonged period of time, we will take that into account. Because if you observe, this one behaves pretty much like your default uh, exponential smoothing, as in propagates last known value. Not an awful lot happens, uh, doesn't adjust downward, which would make sense, right? You've had demand for well, contiguous observations with demand, with non-zero demand, and then the longer uh, dry period goes on, it kind of makes sense to start thinking, okay, maybe I should revise my estimate downwards. And this is what, surprisingly, Croston was uh, devised, I think, like late, late 70s or something like this. It took until 2011 for someone to actually think, hmm, maybe we should extend this. Here you have a link if you feel like reading the original paper. And that's literally what those three gentlemen, Tempter, Sintos, and Babai did. They introduced a manner of adjusting the equation downwards. A difference being P, they kind of a tiny bit of a abuse, abuse in notation. P is not the periodicity, it's the probability of having the demand. So they are kind of decreasing the probability and that's why you multiply your demand estimate, which goes in the same way as manner as before, by the probability that there actually be a non-zero one, which means if you kept shrinking your probability because nothing has been happening for a long time, uh, then your level estimate is also going to start shrinking. Uh, definition follows pretty much analogous uh, format as the uh, as the previous one. There, uh, the rest is also quite similar with the main difference being that we need one more parameter as usual, one for smoothing uh, the level, the other for smoothing the probability of observing a non-zero occurrence. As you can see, we get a mean squared error of 6.12 and here it was 6.95. Well, not that spectacular, but not horrible either, either close to 10% reduction. So at the price of having one extra parameter. The interesting bit is if you observe what it looks like in practice, red one, the, well, as before, blue is the original sales, uh, the red, orange -ish thingy. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a man, I do 16 colors on a good day. Uh, that's the basic cross model. And the warm yellow one, that's the extended one. If you observe, it, it's a little smoother uh, in the period, in the continuing periods of uh, non-zero demand, but if it in the flatlining bits, it starts adjusting downward and then picks up also rather quickly, a bit faster, especially if you look, look I'll maybe try to zoom, make it a bit more visible. 
if you look at this part, it picks up. For, I mean, first of all, where is the original one only flatlined and uh, remained constant, but on a weird level, uh, the extended crust on the TSB starts adjusting downwards and indeed goes to zero and then also picks up faster. Uh, all in all, I would argue a decent improvement for something that works out of the box takes next to no time to estimate, to estimate and uh, just serves as a decent improvement. So to summarize that part, you start with your basic exponential smoothing, which we did in blah, 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 volume one, I believe, the episode one, the one on curves. You move from that to the basic cross tone, which is applying the same logic to periodicity and to the level. And then you introduce the TSB adjustment so that it actually shrinks uh, in the direction, uh, well, downward anytime there is, there is actually zero demand. Uh, any questions at this stage? There is one question from Mark. I, I, I think it's in the context of demand forecasting. So what mm -hmm. are the best techniques for handling outliers? Do we train our models with or without outliers? Depending on the model, depending on the model, uh, if you have something like exponential smoothing, uh, I would probably kill outliers because, uh, well, something spikes and then you smooth it and you're going to see the effect of that, uh, that spike propagating onward a little bit. Uh, on the other hand, if you do something like the machine learning centric approach, which we are, which we are moving to right now, uh, honestly, you probably don't care that much. Uh, at least in, in in the features, in terms of the target quantity, uh, change the distribution. Uh, say, uh, I mean, if it's a single outlier, then yeah, probably just something happened once. But if you get frequent massive spikes, then I would say start thinking about the distribution. Because if you look at, if you uh, say do a regression uh, in, XGBoost or some such, or like GBM, and you specify criterion regression, what it does underneath is it, it, it assumes a parametric form of a distribution, namely Gaussian for your target, which is not necessarily always true. And that's why you have things like specifying Poisson, which allows for a probability mass at zero, or uh, gamma, Tweedy, uh, sorry, Tweedy, Tweedy is called in GBM. Long story short, if it's a single one, kill it, if it's uh, something else like LGBM, start messing with the distribution. In general, I would think twice before dropping an observation because, uh, yeah, it's pretty easy to overdo it. If there are no more questions, then we sail on. Another question. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> we have. Uh, for for a prediction at each store item level, which model would you suggest? Depending if you care about dependent structure between them or not, which is literally what the contrast between first and second part of this uh, of this episode is about. If you don't care and you uh, about you know relationship between them or having factors that imp impact them all, for all I care, parallelize five thousand exponential moving models and do it independently. If on the other hand you have, uh, you know, domain knowledge reason to suspect that they might share, they might share some things like I don't know, uh, react to day of the week seasonality in a similar manner or uh, public holidays, those kinds of things. Then this is what the section very creatively titled ML approach is is about. Something to model them jointly. I, I see the, there are a few more questions. Do you want to take uh, we, now? We, we, yeah, we, we can do one or two more, sure. Sure. Listen, greatest nightmare of any public presentation. You ask other questions and then there's dead silence. <laughs> as long as we're avoiding that one, I'm cool. So the question is, can we use both the models together and prefer cross on TSP for model zero at sales and for non-zero sales, we prefer cross -tone? Uh, yes, in yes, but uh, the question is how do you how do you combine the forecast going forward? Like in terms of explaining what's going on inside the sample, uh, yeah, sure, sure. 
The thing is, looking forward in time, you don't know when are you going to have zeros. So the big question is, how are you going to combine them? You can, of course, do all sorts of things like have two models running in parallel. Uh, one just to predict is it zero or non-zero. So kind of replace the second equation in Croston with a dedicated model, zero, non-zero. And then for the non-zero periods, apply the original one. Uh, but that's, yeah, that's like doing a smarter version of extended Croston. You just, you just replace the... Um, the second equation, the one that's smoothing the probability, with something that's a well smarter method for predicting the same thing. Is there any universal smoothing technique or noise filtering technique? No. All noisy? <laughs> no. Special case of the no free, no free large theorem. <laughs> There's no such thing as a. I mean, there are things that in that in practice more frequently than not work better than others. Like uh, wavelet cleaning, it's probably going to work better than your garden variety exponential smoothing. Much the same way as if you look at deep learning, most of the time LSTM works better than uh, just your plain uh, RNN, but not always. There, there are situations where that's not 100% the case. Mostly yes, but not always. So no, there is no universal. One more and then we go. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so interested in how to extend time series models to deal with hourly data. For example, sales may not happen at night and this leads to two different levels of periodicity on daily cycle and say on weekly seasonality. Uh, for univariate, I would say profit. Profit or arima where you can incorporate to, to, to see. Essentially, you need something that can capture more than one seasonal pattern, which means exponential smoothing is a non-starter. Uh, so yeah, quickly out of the box profit. Uh, you want to be a little more fancy and more importantly, be able to actually do some uh, inference around the uh, parameters of the model, like probabilistically. Uh, then something like Arima or state space uh yeah and then manually override it I'm like manually post process your predictions just say okay you don't you know that sales don't happen at night so you can just flat out fix okay 8 p.m to 7 a.m next morning it's always zero doesn't matter what the model predicted but in general exponential smoothing uh, or what i discussed in part one won't get you very far so you need uh you need something that can handle multiple seasonal pattern. Okay, let's let's sail on. Okay, well, last one. Can you apply uh, FP profit for disadvantages of this model? Uh, yes, you can, as I just said. Uh, disadvantages. Uh, I can't think of a good way to incorporate the idea that you want to start uh, shrinking to zero when it's zero. That's, that's the biggest problem, really. In exponential smoothing, it's kind of, in this setup, it's kind of easy. Or, as we'll see here, if you have something like machine learning, so LGBM, uh, it's also relatively easy because you can mess with the form of your distribution, your parametric distribution. Like, uh, if you look at Gaussian, just continuous, just a bell curve, yeah? But if you look at something like, for instance, uh, Tweedy or Poisson as a, as a discrete distribution, it has a big, big fat probability mass at zero. And this is what you want, because you want to you wanna model explicitly the idea that it can be zero. Not very tiny, but still non zero. No, zero, zero. Uh, so one of those two. And I can't think of a good way to incorporate it in profit. But in all fairness, I am improvising right now. So maybe there is one. Maybe I sit down and think about it. Uh, then there might be. Can't think of one. Uh, moving on. Yeah, tabular data. Well, this is tabular data very clearly. Uh, the model, the method we described, discussed above, was um, for univariate series. What What do you want to do? What can you do if you have uh, multiple stores for which you want to generate predictions at once. It's just a regression problem. 
uh, and in tabular format, throw your favorite number, your favorite algo for running regression. Uh, I think we can more or less agree that unless someone is a fanatical deep learning aficionado, the thing that works fastest out of the box is LGBM. My love for LSTM notwithstanding, but they take a little bit longer to set up. Uh, so that's, that's exactly what we are going to do in this instance. Uh, this is the data that we that we'll be using. By the way, for those of you who have seen this data or intend to drill into this one before, I reduced it just to California, uh, so shrunk in by one third effectively, uh, because I wanted the whole notebook to run in semi-finite time. And in the constraints of Kaggle notebooks, uh, having everything from start, nope, big no-no, which was, by the way, also an issue in the original competition. Uh, just to see, just to look at a few examples of data we have. Well, our friends here. Well, again, active, active, non-active, sort of active, nothing. Here, big nothing, like over half a year. Ditto here. Well, presumably this was a new product that just got introduced, but for some reason got lumped together with everything else in the same data set. Okay. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, you can get away. There's nothing in principle conceptually wrong with just saying, okay, I got 10,000 products. I'm gonna run 10,000 models. Since they're independent, I'm, I'm gonna parallelize the daylight out of the entire problem and that's it. But you are missing out on stuff. Uh, things, sh things sold in the same store, oh, what hell, in the same department, what's it called, department or category they will probably exhibit certain similar characteristics in behavior. Like, I don't know, maybe the alcohol stand was shut down for the entire week. Then nothing sold there would be sold, despite the fact that you're only focused on one product at a time. Uh, ditto for store, ditto for re regulations on, well, in this instance, state level, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, So long story short, it's useful. Uh, that means, in order to reduce it to regression, just you got variety of regression, you need to somehow get rid of the time series aspect. There's two things to do. One, get rid of, well, get rid of, it's a horrible way to phrase it. Capture the temporal dynamics in terms of things that affect every, well, every product or each of your series. And that means things like um, public holidays, uh, day of the week, week of the month, uh, number of number of day within a month because i don't know maybe people have a shopping spree around payday which might happen say i don't know say always on the 20 for some such and uh, that's one thing which is kind of obvious we'll do that later as well the slightly more useful one or slightly more interesting not useful both are useful is using lagged features because if you recall for instance in the uh, arima model we explicitly say that for an uh, ARIMA series, ARMA series, everything depends on the previous observation and two observations before, etc. maybe. You just popped up. There's a lot of questions, I presume. Uh, no, I just wanted to uh, say that, like, can you click on the small hide button that you have there? Yeah. OK, sure. Sorry, I kind of learned to ignore that one. I apologize. Uh, is lag features, meaning we want to be able to capture in terms of dependence in time, not just things that affect every series, but also the past values of each series itself. And that we achieve by lag by lagged features. Uh, well, lags themselves, we just do rolling statistics. In, in my case, I just did the rolling mean here, uh, but uh, over, uh, well, lags uh, going 28 days back, but we also need to shift it a little bit because today I can look at the average of my observations over the last week. And that's perfectly fine for making a prediction for tomorrow. But if I want to pred make prediction for two days from now, then I can't calculate it because tomorrow hasn't happened yet, which means I can only generate features that are available at each point in time in the model. That means, okay, I should say my forward horizon is a week, which means I have to look back a week 
and from that point calculate the moving average of the last seven days and, and so on for different lags and this is what we are doing here with the lag features in all honesty this sounds more complicated than it really is you read what you think for a moment what happens here in shift and then what happens with uh, applying the rolling features into the shifted ones then you go like oh yeah that's bloody obvious what is he talking about so that's 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 all i'm gonna say about this one generate the lag features so moving average rolling statistics for your past values but shift for shift the series first so to make sure you are not leaking that you are in a legit manner using all the only the information that will be available when you are generating a prediction a week to whatever from now after creating those uh shifted features well Voila, we just reduced the whole thing to a uh, to a regression problem that you can feed into LGBM, for instance. As I mentioned earlier, uh, time features, weekday, week of year, month, da da da. Those we can use because there are multiple years in the data, uh, entire four. Hence, the usual rule of thumb. We have more than two periods for each periodicity we are interested in. Okay, we can fit uh, coefficients around this uh, around this uh, periodicity. Uh, ta -da 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 -da, create the columns, encode categorical features, the usual, nothing special here. Split into train and test, and that's it. Regular garden variety uh, LGB. Ah, no, sorry, there's one more thing. Uh, almost garden variety LGBM. That's what I mentioned earlier. You have a distribution of your sales. First of all, epic size tails in both direct. Well, that's probably some error or some artifact of multiple clip. I'm not sure. I'm fairly certain they don't have returns in such amounts. But what's important, huge spike, huge spike in the probability mass at zero, which means we have a lot of zeros, a lot of periods when nothing happened. Uh, what can we do about it? I actually experimented with you. The thing is, if you don't touch objective, this is going to attempt to fit a Gaussian distribution because that's what objective regression, which is a default value in LGBM, does. Uh, well, let's do Poisson. First distribution, for at least from the top of my head, that has a sizable probability mass at zero. And then uh, take it from there. The rest, ta da da, tinker, tinker, optimize at your heart's desire. Uh, that's the most relevant bit. If you, because that, once again, we look at the overall distribution of our features, there's a huge mass at zero, which means we need to see what happens if we, does it help if we account for that? Spoiler alert, yes, it does. Uh, I need to learn to suppress the warnings from LGBM one sunny moment. One sunny moment. Uh, works, doesn't seem to be overfitting terribly. So uh, might, one might even say it's underfitting somewhat. Uh, next step, if we want to be a little smarter with what we do, and I'll skip the full introduction for, for probability course. For those of you interested, uh, uh, what actually what PD distribution actually is, uh, check out the fantastically written uh, Wikipedia entry. What's relevant for our purposes? It's non-negative quantities. It's very flexible with different parameters, and it has a huge spike at zero, but a bit more smoothed out than Poisson. And that's why we can, we can well, it makes sense to attempt it here. Da 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 da. I think if, if you observe, this stopped in the validation error at 2.31. This one went, all, went to 2.29, which, at least as a first pass, I mean, for the record, this is me demonstrating the approach and time use how to reduce time series to a regression problem. So this is by no means state of the art model. OK, just so we're clear in the regarding expectation management. Uh, it is a tweet is, a, is doing a slightly better job than Poisson. This is probably a step in the right direction. Standard stuff. Uh, feature importance item ID, obviously. They have vastly different behaviors per item. Useful bit to observe. Super strong weekly seasonality. Card, the categorical feature representing day of the week. Second most important one. And the moving average uh, at number three. Uh, take home lesson. 
you can always, well, not always, you can very frequently reduce a time series problem to a regression one. Write a code for yourself. If you think, my, I mean, if you feel like stealing mine, steal mine. If you don't feel like it, rewrite it in a manner that's more suited to your taste, but get comfortable using locked features because it can really, really help. Uh, pay attention to the distribution of target. And last but not least, uh, be careful about ranges of possible values. Actually, didn't plot it, but if you do, you can notice that in some instance, the issue is that uh, the distribution doesn't cover the entire range that the original data had, distribution of predictions. Why is that? Because LGBM does not extrapolate. It can only predict values in the range that was observed in the original, in the training data, but not further. Linear models don't have that problem, but uh, LGBM does. So it's useful always to keep in mind. Uh, Okay, I think that would be a good moment for questions, should there be any. Yeah, I do see a few questions. So one let's roll. Um, one of the questions was about uh oh no, I lost it. <laughs> yeah. In scenarios where there are different levels of periodicity, what's the best way to run cross validation? depending on the frequency at which you want to you have to generate your predictions like if you know there is a, a hourly weekly and annual pattern and you have to generate predictions by hour then you yeah you incorporate the other periodicities as well but you generate the prediction by hour it's sort of dictated by the business problem if on the other hand you only care about daily then probably fine aggregating to daily data uh, and then running it daily but so the same frequency you would need for prediction the same frequency you use for for cross validation i mean if you only if you are only interested in average or daily total what do you really care if it got a little fishy around how it was allocated across hours if you only care in terms of the definition of the business problem about what happens at daily level, that's how you run your cross validation. This is more of a comment rather than a question. So would love to see handling on large time series data sets by leveraging something other than pandas like Dask. So are we going to see Dask in the near future? Uh probably because i scribbled something about dusk on the to-do list yes uh terality i honestly have to say no because i don't know what terality is <laughs> so <laughs> i can't promise that i will discuss that one dusk i am somewhat familiar with but i haven't yet uh worked out how to incorporate it so it makes sense but uh sure i mean the tiny what would you call it limitation or in aspect to be taken into account regarding using really really large data we are using in this course or course series of tutorials uh kaggle notebooks as an environment for a reason because that's that removes something that's a usual problem in those circumstances namely i mean i've taught this thing a few times what does it all always start with oh it doesn't work on my computer oh i have version conflict or something the moment people can start trying it out on Kaggle notebooks, this problem goes away. But there are limits to how much computing power can Kaggle hands out for free. So I'll, I'll have to check how big a data set can we push into it uh, while still, you know, the whole thing running in reasonable time. Mm. Hmm. Honestly, as much as you can get away with CPU wise and then like go go to town with number of features and then run brutal feature selection. If you can get away with it in terms of amount of computational power, your time is worth more than CPU time. So just run a big batch job to eliminate it and that's it. It's not like there is a, like, yeah, 12, of course, in this context is a, is a reasonable starting point in terms of business knowledge, but there might be something else that's weird lurking in the data. 
So unless you have really, really solid reason or, you know, good source of knowledge that you trust on the front, that you want to focus on and hence limit the, the possible ranges, do, like I said, generate a bunch and then do brutal feature selection. It's kind of like, it's kind of like trying to fit the size of the architecture, say in terms of number of uh, units in an LSTM layer or you know, layer, the size of the perceptron layer, a fully connected one, yeah? First, you inflate the thing so, so that it starts overfitting because then you know your model has enough capacity, uh, the VC dimension, if you want to get formal, and then you start pruning. But first you need to blow it up so that it starts overfitting because then you know, okay, at least it can learn all there is in the data. Uh, much the same philosophy here. Okay, let's do this one and then we move to the last bit. Uh, because Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> no, 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 Vicky, I'm, uh, I'm just trying to, you know, try to start being more mindful of time, especially that it's a work day. Is it recommended same, uh, same, what's same? To adjust the forecast, main the daily granular the forecast. Main... Uh, I don't know about recommended, same for sure. Is it potentially beneficial? Yes. Yes. If you have, for instance, going forward, something like, uh, I'm improvising an example right now. So, Cavea Temptor, uh, you, are gener you, are, you are looking at daily data and your forecast going forward says daily, but you have a weekly forecast or something or even monthly. Uh, yeah, by all means, use it as one of the covariates. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't directly call it adjusting. You can, I, I would think of it more as, as uh, use it as explanatory covariates or uh, view it as a sort of, uh, what would you call it? Reformulate as a hierarchical problem. So there is a reconciliation so that you don't predict more. Uh, the, the sum of your daily predictions is not higher or at least not brutal, extremely higher than uh, than your weekly prediction. Um, by the way, hierarchical series are coming, but there's, it's just that pretty much any topic I mention as a sideline or potential avenue, there's someone asking about it and I'm like, guys, <laughs> I'm doing my best here, but there's only one topic I can squeeze into a weekly episode at the time and I do have to make judgment calls. But yes, hierarchical series most certainly are coming because I think it's it's a topic that doesn't get anywhere near the level of love and attention it deserves. And if no one's offended by that, I'll pause the questions for now so I can say a few words about the new launches and then we'll catch up on the on the questions. If that, I hope it's okay with everyone. Uh, new launches. If we have long histories, like we did in the in the examples from the M5 competition, well, it's pretty much straight uh, time series problem. That's not always the case because sometimes new things do happen. Uh, the question is, what do we do then? The data set I managed to get my hands on is called visual data set. You have the whole description under the link. Uh, and it's actually, we can have a look at this just to give a bit of a context. Da, 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 da. No, that's forms. I can't find it. Uh, never mind. This is from this paper uh, where the, the important bit over 5,000, 5.5K new products in fashion, which is a very good field to try to predict something because things change a lot. They do have patterns of, of all sorts, uh, seasonal or whatnot. They have trends and there's new stuff going on. So it's, it's a good field to, in, which to, in which to test certain things. Uh, I am using a brutally, subs brutally chopped subset because the original data set there isn't so big. <coughs> Excuse me, it's got images. I didn't wanna, I kinda viewed images for this one as a distraction. So, I, so for the purpose of what we're doing here, I focused only on the um, tabular title part of the data. So for each new release, we have a bunch of categorical features which are horrible to display here this helps 
zero to 11 sales in the 12, first 12 days. External code irrelevant, season category, essentially categorical feature descri describing our fashion product, uh, short sleeve, long sleeve, uh, shirt, jacket, yada, yada. Color, fabric, some extras, I mean, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, this is kind of a fringe territory because I was improvising a little bit around this one. Because to be perfectly honest, I didn't manage to find anything that would qualify as a standard approach for those matter. So idea number one, what can we do uh, to predict this sequence? Well, we can take the categorical, categorical variables as our covariates, and we can try to predict an entire series. Advantage of this approach, uh, we can just feed everything into something like multi-output regressor. So a uh, multi-output regressor, for those of you unfamiliar, uh, extension of, your, of well, something that works as a wrapper, pretty much every, most, maybe not all, but most uh, regression algorithms in scikit-learn. And then it parallelizes the whole thing, so you can predict a vector and not just a scalar per point. That's 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 what multi that's yeah long story short explanation of what multi output regressor does. Uh, so that's what we do. Uh, we have the targets, we have the categorical columns, ta da 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 get dummies so we can fit it into reach because I seriously went the line of least resistance here just to show you the idea. Multi how do we go about this? We define what's our basic model so the workhorse that will be fitted for each of the series individually. Uh, then we wrap it in multi-output. And unless you have too much time, I strongly recommend parallelizing the whole thing. And then we use it as if it was a standard scikit-learn uh, fitted model. Da, 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 fitted mean squared error. Mm, the, important, the important thing to keep in mind, this is predicting uh the logic behind multi-output regressor it's predicting each of the points independently which means we are utterly ignoring memory and serial dependence in the time series that we want to predict of new sales for this new product so that's a downside the price to pay for the fact that we can parallelize it in a very easy and elegant, well fairly elegant manner uh what does it look like when we plot it Ma does seem to capture a little bit of the general dynamics in the first four days, and then it starts drifting apart. On the other hand, you'll take at another example, and it's like, uh, no, that is not going well. Level-wise, nah, I've seen worse, but nothing to write home about. Then again, this is new stuff. So we are, you know, on a mental map of time series universe. This is the segment that's labeled here, there be dragons. So let's, let's be honest, how much can you really expect for stuff that's new and you're trying to bootstrap your way out of trouble? Uh, idea number two, we can try to generate embeddings for our product. Again, this is a very crude take on embeddings because I'm only embedding the categorical part. Normally, the full-blown solution would obviously involve embedding, well, the entire text of the description as well, especially the images. Uh, the core idea, we create embeddings for all, all the products that we have, old and new alike. Uh, we cluster the ones where the futures, uh, the, where the future series are not essentially a training set. We map, we calculate a sort of uh, prototype per cluster. It's kind of abusing terminology, but an average for all the series of the uh, products belonging to this cluster. And then we look at the new ones. Okay, we map. This is my closest cluster. This is the average sales that happens in this cluster. Boom, this is my prediction. And this is exactly what we're gonna, we gonna do here. Create a little bit, I called it correct time because there was something really weird about those timestamps. Uh, simplest way, just do it like this. Uh, categorical columns, da da da, the usual. Uh, shout out to the original creator of this idea, I took, which I took the liberty of borrowing. Uh, what are we doing here? If you know how word to vec works, you understand how to do cut to vec. Instances of our 
values of our categorical attributes. Those are words, combinations of our cat categorical attributes that occur for different products. Those are uh, sentences. The only extra thing that we need to do is we need to shuffle them a little bit because, well, words can occur in different order in a sentence and not necessarily the way it's here. Uh, ta da feed cut to vec model, generate the embeddings. Nothing fancy, just applying the logic that everyone has seen probably, you know, a million times if you work in this field. Uh, I mean, be glad I could have given that man to woman is, is as king is to queen example. Uh, what next? We cluster it. We, again, standard stuff. We cluster the embeddings. We map everything to the appropriate clusters. Ditto for the test set. First the training and then test set. We calculate the average of the sales, which is the value associated with our each observation. We average those per cluster. So this is sort of our prototypical sales happening for products from this group. Uh, calculate the MSC. Okay, how is it doing? Uh, looking at the same three products that we have uh, used before, the same three examples. Ma, it's doing a little better for this product. It's doing a little better here. It's still kind of horrible, but it's uh, the yellow line, the prediction based on clustering as opposed to prediction based on the multi-output regression, but it's a little less horrible. Uh, yeah, this one on the other hand, nothing to read home about. Uh, and that would wrap up and I am, I am in time. I'm very proud of myself, first time this worked. Uh, this concludes our part about predicting demand. Take home lesson, <laughs> in those three points here. And now we can do, I think, 10, 10 to 15 minutes questions. So because yeah, I, I do see one question. So thank you, first of all, for the awesome session once again. I don't have to of say course. that it's always awesome. Um, thank so you. the question is, what is the best technique for categorical kind of univariate time series where each category is Gaussian? Categorical and Gaussian. Uh, I'm sorry, but could I ask the author to please elaborate a little bit because I'm not sure I understand how can things be categorical and Gaussian at the same time. Uh, no, I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Despite my I, best effort, I, I don't understand that one. I think I got a message from the author on Discord Okay. Uh, so he's talking about something like this. Can you see this? Uh, yeah, I see a distribution with multiple peaks, so multi-model, but I'm not completely sure how it's how does Gaussian and categorical play into that. I'm sorry. Yeah, but if you if you can elaborate your question or just ask in yeah, Discord. I would, uh, yeah. I would very much appreciate channel. that. Yeah. So I, I see another question. So if you have any questions, please ask now um, because the session has ended. So which embedding yeah. size is recommended to use? Is there any common sense logic based on the number of items? Uh, probably an overkill to do more than the, more bigger embeddings than you have items. Uh, usually bigger is better until you start getting memory errors. <laughs> if you want me to be completely honest. Bigger is better because if you have, even if you have big embedding and it turns out to be a bit too sparse, you can always regularize it or compress it a little bit. I don't know, run it through an autoencoder or something, or bloody PCA if that's if that's your heart's desire. So no, it's not like there's a golden rule how much there should be. I mean, I what what did I pick here? Uh, vector size ten, yeah, guesstimate. Guestimate. Um, when another question is coming up, it mm -hmm. says any recommended sources resources to further study sales and demand forecasting. 
Aha. Uh, let me know when you find them. I actually, the way I approach it is, I mean, the reason this was kind of fun to write is because I had to go on a bit of a treasure hunt. Stuff like Arriva and Profit are fairly well understood. And if you don't know how to formulate something nicely, so there's a chance someone, someone has already done it. Uh, with sales and demand, you get two things. You get uh, papers like the one that I referenced here. Uh, da, 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 da. What was it? The visual. Yeah. Uh, so really cutting edge stuff or almost Excel. That's how you calculate it in Excel to sum those cells. Uh, so no. I am not aware of proper of uh, resources specifically focusing on this one. You might get a bit more luck if you start looking for things that explicitly mention modeling intermittent series, because sales is sales and demand is the um, is the most uh, famous example, most popular, most widespread, but it's not the only one. There are other fields when you run into the same situation as well. So you know, you find something good, you, you let the rest of us know. So I, I don't see any more questions for today. So I I think it was good timing. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, good timing too. I think for the first time we are finishing on time. So I know, right? Maybe the work they're doing it on work days isn't such a bad idea after all. <laughs> so thank you once again, Conrad, for joining today. Thanks and if you have me. any further questions, please join Discord where you can ask. Uh, ask, in the, ask in the time series channel. Yeah, I ask try in the to time be series channel. Then it's useful for everyone. Yes. Um, thank you, Conrad. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Have a nice evening.